Hello semiconductor students. In this video demo I'm going to be showing you how to use the TINA TI circuit simulation software to predict the outcome of a voltage uh, regulator. In this regulator we're basically rectifying some uh, some alternating current. So you should recognize our, our little diode array here as a, a full bridge rectifier and we're powering it with a voltage source uh, we're, gonna, we're using a sine wave with 15 volts amplitude, 30 volts peak to peak, and 50 hertz. So this is about the same frequency that you would get from grid power, uh, but much lower voltage. So I've picked the 50 hertz uh, arbitrarily. It's easy for calculations, but basically the same kind of argument would work for any kind of uh, frequency. You would just uh, be adjusting um, your time constant of your your capacitor uh, to make sure that you maintain your voltage between uh, your your AC peaks. So we so we have 15 volts amplitude, 50 hertz, or a 20 millisecond period for each waveform. So the way we have the circuit now, we have what's known as pulse DC coming into our 10 kilohertz load. And if we want to take a look at what the voltage drop over the load would be, we can display our voltage transient using our, our, um, our voltage point sensor V load that we've placed in our circuit. So it's going to be measuring voltage versus ground, which we have here. I'm not displaying the input voltage, so we're only getting V load. And so you can see this is our typical pulse DC. We are, we are seeing the drop over the diodes. We're not getting the full 15 volts. We're getting 15 volts minus our forward bias voltage over two of our rectifying diodes. Now, this is great to run a lot of applications. It is DC and that it is not reversing, but it's certainly not a steady um, true DC signal, which would be time invariant. So we're going to start adding some things to the circuit to see how close we can get to true DC. So the first thing we're going to do is rely on the fact that we can add a capacitor which will store some charge and produce a voltage that can kind of bridge us from peak to peak. Uh, what we kind of need is um, an, a secondary voltage source that will keep us from dropping uh, when, when our signal coming out of the bridge drops. And so I've selected a 220 microfarad capacitor because if I look at the time constant multiplying this by my R load, I get something that's like 10 times the period of my waveform. So that should give me some, an output that's pretty close to steady state. So that should keep me from dropping. So I'm going to Put, I'm going to put that in parallel with my load. So basically when I get that pulse DC coming out, it will initially it will charge the capacitor, will stay charged, and then as the waveform drops down to zero, the, the capacitor voltage and the capacitor charge will, um, will be powering the load circuit. So it is effectively like a secondary voltage source in parallel with my bridge uh, to bridge the voltage, pun intended, from one peak to another. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. We're going to again look at a couple four periods and boom we come up and we don't go down. The other nice thing is with the the load resistor that we have we can zoom in here and we can see that we have a little bit of ripple, but very, very little compared to the magnitude of the signal. So this is what we want when we're trying to achieve something close to true DC. We want to see a, a very small variation superimposed on our, on our main signal. So we have something like 13.6 volts, maybe 13.5, and then our ripple we're going to measure it here with the cursor. So we have 13.59 minus 13.55. So very, very low. We have something in the order of, of maybe 50 millivolts of, of peak to peak ripple superimposed on 13 and a half volts. So several orders of magnitude. This would do very well uh, as a good simulation of true DC. It's not completely invariant like would get out of a battery, but it's really, really close. Okay, 
So that's all fine and well, uh, given that we have a very big load resistor. So one problem is, though, uh, we've got our capacitor that will be part of our, effectively, our power supply circuit, but our load is a whole other circuit or another device. It's the thing we're plugging into our, our you know, rectified DC supply. What if we plug in something with a much smaller resistance? So what if we have only one kilo ohm load resistor? Now this is going to start causing a problem because what we'll have effectively done now is we'll have decreased the time constant of our of our little RC circuit here and we'll start discharging that capacitor much faster through the load such that it might not be able to maintain a voltage to bridge us so to speak from the peak to the peak coming out of the bridge. So let's see what a three order of magnitude drop in our load resistor does to our signal. So we still have, you know, a fairly small ripple on top of our uh, of our main uh, almost DC signal, but it's not negligible anymore. So we've still got something on the order of, whoops, let's get our cursor here. So if we go kind of right in the middle to get the average DC, we've got now 13 and a quarter volts main signal, but our ripple goes from about 13.08 to 13.46. So now we have something closer to 400 millivolts of ripple superimposed on 13 and a quarter volts. It's still small, but now it's no longer negligible. If we had a, a fairly sensitive kind of application that can't tolerate any kind of um, alternating current even at a low voltage, we could start seeing problems from this. Now we could we could look at an even more extreme situation. We'll go down one more order of magnitude. So we went down three orders of magnitude. Now we're just going to go down one to a hundred ohms and we're going to take a look at what our waveform looks like. So by going from a 10 kilo ohm to a hundred ohm resistor, uh, we now are in a situation where we've got a significant amount of ripple. Our, our average DC is now only about 11 and a half volts and our ripple peak to peak goes from 13.3 all the way down to less than 10. So now we're in the, the significant fraction. Our ripple is now, you know, tens of percent of our, our main uh, DC signal, which would be more or less unacceptable for anything that required a smoothed, um, nearly constant DC. Now we didn't change the circuit, we just changed what we plugged into it effectively in the form of the load resistor. Um, it would be really nice if we had a way to basically plug whatever we wanted in within reason and draw uh, whatever amount of current we wanted within reason and still get a constant voltage signal. And the way we can do that is to sacrifice some of the amplitude that we get out. If instead of getting an average of, of what was this? Doo -doo -doo. We're looking at the Y plot. Instead of 11 and a half, 11 and three quarters, what if we only needed six, six and a half? What if that was enough? Uh, if we are willing to sacrifice some amplitude, not changing our source, one of the things that we can do is add a Zener diode to this circuit and basically use the Zener diode as a secondary regulator of what's coming out of our capacitor and further smooth out what gets to the load. And in this case, it isn't quite so much smoothing as it is a bit more like a diode clipper. We're going to shunt uh, the current that we no longer need uh, going to the load, shunt some of the voltage as well. Um, we'll have current flowing through our zener instead of through the load. We'll have lower voltage at the load, but we're going to get that same voltage irrespective of of the load resistance and load current within reason. So I'm going to go ahead and hook that circuit up. It's going to require a little bit of rearranging here. See if we can just move all of this down. See if it'll extend. Okay. 
So if we're going to use a zener, one of the things we need to do is make sure we don't uh, give it too much current. So we're going to use another resistor as a current limiting resistor. So basically we have you know, reasonably high voltage here at the capacitor. It's coming out of the bridge or that voltage is being maintained right here by the capacitor. We're going to drop some of it over this current limiting resistor so that the voltage we introduce to our zener doesn't exceed the limits. And we're going to use a, a fairly stock zener diode, small scale one. We're going to put it in in parallel. So now this node is cannot, for the most part, exceed the breakdown voltage of the Zener diode. As soon as this node right here, which is at the same potential as V-load, once this rises above this, the breakdown, the reverse breakdown voltage of this Zener diode, the diode will start conducting with very little resistance and maintain this point, hopefully right at the Zener breakdown voltage, reverse breakdown, which it's designed for. Remember, Zeners are designed to work backwards. That's okay, they can do that all day long. And so that will give us a, a very well controlled voltage over the load, which hopefully will be uh, less susceptible to the current that we demand in this part of our circuit. So let's, let's check to make sure we're going to get the voltage we want. We can look at our properties and you can see Tina is telling us that this is a 6.8 volt Zener which means it's BV reverse breakdown voltage should be 6.8. Now that's under a certain set of test conditions. We may or may not see that exact value on our circuit, uh, but it should be something between six and six and a half, give or take. So we can go ahead and just rerun this and let's rerun this with the 100 ohm load, which is the one that is most likely to challenge the circuit. Uh, this is gonna draw a fair amount of current Coming from this node, we're going to get a reasonable voltage drop over this resistor. And our limiting case, remember, for a Zener circuit is if we drop too much voltage over our, our current limiting resistor and we don't have a voltage at this node here that exceeds our Zener breakdown voltage, then the Zener isn't controlling anything. We're just going to get whatever comes out of the capacitor. If we don't drop enough voltage and we have something huge here, we could end up getting too much current going through the Zener and then it could fail. And Tina will actually represent that failure in most cases as an open. So if you're building a circuit in the Tina simulation software and you're using a Zener and you're, you're applying a very, very high voltage to your, um, into your bridge and the voltage of this node is too high and your output shows that the Zener is not controlling anything, that you're getting load voltages well in excess of Zener breakdown, check to make sure you don't have too much current flowing through. So, but these numbers shouldn't do that to us. So we're gonna, again, look at the same waveforms. We are not drawing the excitation voltage. We don't really need to see what's going on over at the source. We're just looking at V-load. So oop, we definitely have a problem there. So, got some troubleshooting to do. We're getting zero, so chances are something is not hooked up correctly. So we're gonna go troubleshoot and make sure we don't have it open somewhere. Our load, B load. I'm gonna take a pause and do some. Well, maybe not. We'll just we'll just talk through some troubleshooting here. Oop! There's probably our open. So now we have a we have a. a black dot indicating that there is a true node so that means there really is continuity so by having a zero volts at the load when I'm running the source that meant that, that there was an open somewhere so let's see if we have troubleshot our circuit there we go okay we still have a little bit of ripple that we're seeing and so what we may be doing now is dropping below the level of Zener voltage control. But as you can see, our Y voltage is now maxing out at 6.2. So we aren't, we aren't allowing more than the Zener breakdown voltage to pass. Unfortunately, because we don't have a flat line and we're, we're ramping down below the Zener voltage, what that means is that, that this point here is dropping below 
our Zener breakdown voltage. So this resistor is probably a bit on on the the high side. It's our we're limiting um, current too much. We're getting too big of a voltage drop. So let's try sizing that down and see what we get. So we've dropped that down to 50, and we're going to rerun our analysis. And now we get a higher number and we get a much flatter ripple. Now that effect should also be lessened uh, when we go to um, a higher load resistor. We demand less current because as we demand less current flowing through this current limiting resistor we have less voltage drop and so we'll maintain this node at Zener voltage where it belongs. We could probably drop this a little bit more. Let's go down to 20 and rerun. We should get a fairly flat line. Not a lot of change, the, uh, but the, the average went up, so we're getting closer to, to full theoretical Zener voltage. So let's throttle the current down in this part of the circuit total. Let's go to a higher load voltage. Let's go up to 1K. The main point we've already seen, though, we are not getting the huge multiple percent of of total DC voltage uh, in our ripple. Uh, even at 100 ohms, our ripple is, well, let's go ahead and measure it before we rerun the analysis. So we have an average, we have an average DC of about 6.4 volts, and the ripple goes from 6.4 to 6.25. So we're getting something on the order of 200 millivolts out of 6 for that same 100 ohm load resistor. Remember, without the Zener, just using the smoothing capacitor, the same smoothing capacitor, we were getting something on the order of maybe 25% instead of, you know, maybe less than 10%. So the Zener has already done us some good. And it will look even better with the 100 ohm excuse me, the one kilo ohm load resistor. So we've smoothed out a bit more. So the moral of the story, and I, I won't show what happens when we make an error and we, we basically blow the Zener open. That's something we don't want to see. Um, and that, that is an, basically the way the software represents excess current. Uh, in practice, we would not exceed that. Uh, we would design um, the voltage at this point coming out of the bridge and the capacitor and we would design our uh, our load resistor such that at the maximum voltage coming from our capacitor um, and we can use a, a little meter and uh, voltage node indicator and, and actually measure that if we want we would use that maximum amplitude look at the current flowing over our current limiting resistor and the voltage at this node and then go through our circuit analysis and calculate the current that we would then get through the Zener, uh, given whatever our load resistor is, and make sure that it doesn't exceed the reverse max current, which if we want to look up on this little guy, is something about 1.85. So breakdown current. So we want to keep our current, you know, much lower than that. So if we if we took this resistor down to maybe two ohms or took it out, um, then Tina would represent a malfunction of the Zener by just having it not operate as if it were an open, and we'd get no Zener control. But that that is uh, not something we're going to do because we'll we will not overload our Zener. In fact, that's the whole reason we include this current limiting resistor. And again, it's it's a balance. We do our calculations so that we keep this node always above the Zener breakdown voltage, reverse breakdown voltage, so the Zener will control the voltage at this point. But we don't want it to go so high that we're driving too much current through the Zener and it exceeds its, its rated capacity. So moral of the story, if we want a, a modest and minimal ripple, that is independent of what we plug into our power supply, um, adding the Zener and its current limiting resistor to the smoothing capacitor gives us um, quite a bit of, of load tolerance um, to our ripple control. So I have a small amount, but it is smaller, and most importantly, it's load invariant. 
So that concludes our, um, our TINA demonstration of um, uh, load invariant rectification and handy use of a Zener diode.